Shalom Alaikum viewers, my name is Nicholas Mansfield, my channel is Islam vs. Christianity vs. Judaism. I commenced uh, earlier this year upon a series of videos for YouTube, uh, beginning with the pre-mortal Messiah, building up to the uh, Gospel accounts of the New Testament, amongst other th sources for the life ministry of Messiah, known as J.C. Jesus, or Yeshua ben Miriam, otherwise. Now, this present series that I'm working on, this is the final part, part four. This is the timeline of the Messiah, and the focus previously has been upon uh, largely upon the chapter 9 of Daniel and some other related uh, portions of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, with cross references to the Quran, the Gospels. Uh, this is the uh, focus on the rest of that timeline uh, building up from Daniel. In the accounts known as Nehemiah and Ezra, specifically, uh, these accounts, when combined, uh, build up a timeline which has to be reconciled with the historic records from that period of approximately two and a half thousand years ago, and the end of the exile for Yoda, uh, the Jewish. Uh, people returned from exile in Babylon, although many of them were still there in the land of Israel. And this was a period of uh, a great deal of history and uh, biblical text being mixed up. Now, we're going to see this as we look in detail. I'll read you from my... Uh, combination of accounts from modern and ancient sources and here we go. Uh, we must examine the biblical records associated with this period. These are thought to have been shaped by Ezra as were certain other scrolls according to a number of modern scholars who subscribe to some form what's known as the documentary hypothesis. To begin a balanced examination of Ezra's merit, both as a source and as a historic figure, we must read first from the accounts of the return to the land. The scrolls known as Ezra and Achemia, compiled from earlier Aramaic and Hebrew sources, now this is a great change because the Bible was almost uh, exclusively uh, in the language of Hebrew, uh, but in Daniel and uh, Ezra and Achemia, we start to see a mixture, a breakdown of almost half and half, Aramaic and Hebrew. Now, they came to be incorporated into the Tanakh, but there were other forms of the story, such as first Esdras, which was clearly favoured by some learned Jews such as Titus Flavius Josephus and 2nd Esdras, which uh, had two additional appendages uh, known as 5th and 6th Ezra. These being clearly fictional, with accounts that describe great prophetic attributes to Ezra, rivaling even Moses. In truth, this all begins in a prophetic scroll for the latter days, describing contemporary events of the day, which were incorporated into Greater Isaiah. So I'm going to have to read to you from Isaiah, and the references are 44, chapter 44, verse 24a, Going to verse 28, and Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus says Jehovah, 
God, the one speaking to Koresh, my shepherd and all my delight, he shall render complete, even unto saying to Jerusalem, she shall be built, and a temple, her foundation shall be laid. Thus says Jehovah unto his anointed to Koresh, whom I strengthened in right hand to beat down nations before his face. And loincloths of kings I will unfasten to open great gates before his face, and gates will not be closed. Concerning the mention in Isaiah, 44.28 to 45.8 This appears to be a blatant piece of politically correct prose grafted into the authentic collection of prophecies by a certain scribe as is the case for the ending of Chronicles as in 2 Chronicles 36 verses 22 to 23 yet even this has been proven to have a degree of genuine prophetic merit in these latter days whether self-fulfilling or not, given the uncanny case for American President Donald Trump being the new Koresh, or Cyrus, from his age of 70 in respect to attaining the U.S. presidency, the scroll known as Ezra was shaped as a continuation of Daniel, as detailed by Rashi, rather intricately too according to his Jewish sources. So it must be mentioned here, in accordance with the ancient expectation, King Koresh II of Persia, founder of a Achaemenid Empire, is thought to have lived 70 years, his reign enduring approximately 30 years. In addition to this, let it be stated that Koresh was the antithesis of Pharaoh, and he has been fulfilled in a biblically prophetic sense in these latter days. Through legacy, according to the promise to Israel's restoration given by President Donald Trump, the one given power over all the earth from his 70th year. Under Koresh, the Achaemenid Empire came to be the greatest world power of the era occupying all the previous civilized states of the ancient Near East, conquering most of Southwest Asia, much of Central Asia, and the Caucasus, the empire grew even larger under his successors and enveloped western regions from Bulgaria, Paeonia, and Thrace, Macedonia, the Balkan regions, and Eastern Europe to the Indus Valley in the east. Cyrenaica, Egypt, and Nubia in the south, one estimate suggests that at one time, over 40% of the world's population was subject to this empire. Initially, Daniel prophesied the formation of the empire to King Nebuchadnezzar II, but subsequently to Belshazzar and its demise, as detailed in Daniel chapter 2, verse 32, verse 39, and chapter 7, verse 5, and chapter 8, Verses 1 to 7. From Ezekiel's testimony to a certain Daniel of wisdom, as in Ezekiel 14, verse 14, 20, and chapter 28, verse 3, it is plausible that he was born around 605 BC. I refer to Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, given that he was taken to Babylon as a boy by King Nebuchadnezzar II's forces circa 597 BC. The siege leading to the destruction of Jerusalem the following decade, around 587 BC, provides an indication that Daniel's prayer for a return to Israel occurred during the period shortly before the fulfillment of 70 years in exile, as his age lay heavy upon him, see Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 to 2, around about 521 BC. The words may mean that he was the force which caused Daniel's earlier prophecy of succession to begin, but it is also plausible that King Koresh II had made a decree, the literal interpretation of the relevant scrolls, but only at the end of his days, and succession through any plans into disarray. 
Alternatively, Darius, his first enduring successor, was also known as the Great, and a dynastic title was rendered. The kings listed in the biblical scripture lack a firm degree of historic integrity in some instances, given other possible successes during this period, such as Cambyses uh, II or Bardia, otherwise known as Smyrdas, and the accounts in Ezra, and the Chimera in particular, have been influenced by many hands, and Archaxerxes was actually Darius's son, Histopes his father. Now compare this to Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. We start to see some problems, some confusion that could only relate to these accounts being written some hundreds of years later. It may even be that Daniel made his most famous prayer around 517 BC, perhaps two to four years later than his scroll suggests relative to our modern reckoning from limited ancient sources. Whatever the case, it seems sure that 70 years had to be fulfilled nigh this time if one is to believe the general premises of the Bible uh, regarding Daniel 9. Refer to Second Chronicles chapter 36 verse 21. The first 10 years from 597 BC are for the Ten Commandments broken. 13 decades complete the cycle, circa 457 BC. Now, let us refer to the Nark again. Uh, Ezra 1 1. And we shall run along all the way into verse 3 of the first chapter of Ezra. And in the first year of King Koresh of Persia, unto the word of Jehovah spoken by Jeremiah being fulfilled. Yehovah roused the spirit of King Koresh of Persia to issue a proclamation throughout his realm by word of mouth and in writing as follows. Thus said King Koresh of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the known earth, Yehovah God of the heavens has given me and has charged me with building him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Yehuda. Any one of you, of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, that is in Yehuda, and build a house of Yehovah, Israel's God, the God that is in Jerusalem. Now let us read again from Ezra, but the third chapter. We will go on. How far? From verses 1 all the way up to verse 8 of chapter 3 of Ezra. And the seventh month was established, Israel's sons and towns they gathered the people as one man unto Jerusalem. And Shur ben Yosedek arose, and his brothers, the priests, and Zerubbabel ben Shealtiel, and his brothers, and they built an altar of Israel's God unto the ascension by whole burnt offerings arising on it, as it is written in Mosaic Torah of the higher man of God. And they set up the altar on its site, since they were in dread on account of other inhabitants of the region. I refer to Ezra chapter 4 verse 4, Achimia chapter 4. Uh, verses 11 to 13, or verses 5 to 7 in the Tanakh. And upon it they sent whole burnt offerings drifting up to Yehovah, whole burnt offerings drifting up at dawn and dusk. And they observed the festival of Sukkot, as it is written, and whole burnt offerings drifting up day by day, in account according to statute, a thing day in, day out, and henceforth a burnt offering drifting up perpetually, and to new moons, and to all appointed times, from those dedicated of Jehovah, and to all who ventured free will offerings, a free will offering unto Jehovah. 
from day one until the seventh month was the commencement unto the ascension of whole burnt offerings drifting up to Yehovah. And Yehovah's temple was not yet founded. And they delivered up money to the quarriers and to the craftsmen, and food and drink, and oil to Sidonians and to Tyrians, unto coming with timbers of cedars from the Lebanon to Sea of Jaffa, by permission of Koresh, king of Persia, upon them. And in the second year unto their coming, in the house of God to Jerusalem, in the second month they started, Zerubbabel ben Shealtiel, and Yeshua ben Yosedek, and a remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those coming from the captivity to Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from a son of a twentieth year and up, to oversee according to affairs of Yehovah's house. In other words, the house being the temple, the sanctuary, etc. Concerning the timing of the reconstruction upon the end of King Koresh's reign and considering the major monarchs upon King Darius I's, or Darius the Great, his reign from circa uh, 522 to 486 BC, and Xerxes, uh, the first circa 486 to 465 BC, continuing until King Artaxerxes the first circa 465 to 424 BC, there was eventually an enforced cessation due to political intervention by one of the kings. Read Ezra chapter 4 verses 4 to 7, terminating sometime around the second year, as in Ezra chapter 4 verses 23 to 24 circa 463 BC. Yet the initial temple works were completed by the end of the Mosaic year during the sixth year of Darius circa 517 BC, having been supposedly undertaken with the endorsement of the three foreign monarchs as per Ezra chapter 6 13 to 15th verse. A sum total of 60 years after the completion of 70 years in exile, that being 10 years on from the initial violation of Solomon's temple, read 2 Kings chapter 24 verses 8 to 13. Later on, but still around the time of King Artaxerxes I and the latter part of the 7th year, circa 458 BC, Ezra came up to Jerusalem in a substantial company reading Ezra chapter 7 verse 7, possibly of some thousands for security regarding the king's offering. Read Ezra chapter 7 verses 15 to 16, chapter 8, 1 to 14. This was in fact after Nehemiah had taken up governance and Jerusalem was well on the path to being restored, the walls having been recently completed. Read Ezra chapter 9 verse 9 and Nehemiah cross-reference uh, chapter 7 verse 1. If one takes a biblical text at face value, then there is an apparent contradiction in the chronology given that King Koresh died around 530 BC, at least two years prior to the earliest possible reckoning of 70 years, if not 12. Taking the claim of the sixth year of Darius is seemingly harmonious since the interpretation of this date is 517 BC, being required 70 years distant to the time of the ultimate Babylonian conflict being 587 BC. If the latter case is acceptable, and in no disagreement with the date given in Daniel, then the only chronological error therein is that Xerxes I is not written as son to Darius I, but erroneously as his father, in Daniel 9 verse 1, as previously stated. The Chemia commences with a chronology from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, we see in the Chemia, chapter 1 verse 1 and chapter 2 verse 1, circa 445 BC, and finishes sometime after 433 BC on that basis, reading the Chemia, chapter 13 verse 6. That does not work at all. Given the chronology of Ezra and the double entwined 70 years, but if the unknown scribe had conflated King Xerxes I with King Artaxerxes I 
and the authentic reckoning must be from the reign of the former, just as the mention of Koresh is treated leniently, then the relevant periods in the Kemia become 466 BC and 454 BC, another realistic proposition. This has to be the duration of Nehemiah's governance, else Ezra has preceded him. Reading Nehemiah 5 verse 14 and Haggai chapter 2 verses 18 to 23. And that seems irreconcilable given Ezra's intent for instituting Torah according to his own agenda. The real issue is the interference in the reconstruction efforts by a coalition of neighboring states which results in a suspension of building work for nigh the duration of one king's reign and a few years into that of his successor, reading from Ezra chapter 4 verses 6 to 24. These kings are named as Artaxerxes and Darius of Persia but the latter clearly preceded the former. Logically, the text should show Darius, then Artaxerxes. The only remaining problem becomes Nehemiah's chronology. If work recommenced in the uh, second year of Artaxerxes, as I have suggested, then his scroll has been found in error concerning the claim of the 20th year and so forth. Certainly this scroll contains dates which do not reconcile well with the other biblical and historic data sources. According to the text centered around his enforcement of ethnic segregation, Ezra is presented with allegations against his fellow priests and Levites by the governing elect. The term used for the remnant of Israel is identical to that used by Isaiah, a holy seed. Read Ezra 9 uh, verses 1 to 2 or 2 to 3 in the Tanakh and Isaiah 6 verse 13. The issue becomes one of context. Here we see another key Pharisaic principle coming into play, that of building a fence around Torah. Read Ezra chapter 3, verse 10 or 9 in the Tanakh, so that a law which was applicable to few now becomes applicable to all. The entire context simply seems too providential. There is a controversy to this day concerning whether Ezra laid claim to the title of high priest. The text suggests he could not have been such, certainly not at this time, as he would have been in defiance of Torah. Yet it will be shown that this may be construed prophetically, and the exact opposite may be true based solely on this verse. Reading Ezra 9 verse 3 and 5 or 4 and 6 in this Nark. Compare this to Matthew chapter 26, 65a, corresponding to Mark chapter 14, verse 63a. Ezra played his cards and enforced his marriage ban for Israelites and foreign women, but there is a problem here with the literal interpretation the reading of the translated text. Here the people are accused of acting treacherously, but it is those who were of the exiles. Read Ezra chapter 10 verse 6. Here it is apparent that there is a great separation of time and outlook between Ezra's group and the original 49,000 who departed after King Koresh. As it is written, uh, refer to Ezra chapter 2 verses 64 to 65. The original group, the builders and their supporters, were said to be under the guidance of two prophets, reading Ezra chapter 5 verse 1 and chapter 6 verse 14, yet they were accused of violating Torah. If they were doing evil, then surely an entire community should have acted to prevent this happening at the time. This was a community who had sacrificed all they had for the glory of God, reading the Kimia chapter 5, 
other Israelites survived the Babylonian conquest without having been deported. And they had been dispersed throughout the land, yet they seemed to be relegated to third-class status at face value. Reading between the lines, Ezra was determined to bring the entire people under his theological sway and to divide those who were less desirable to him. Reading Ezra chapter 10 verses 7 to 13. Those who were strongest, the princes, possibly those who had accompanied him from Babylon, who raised the charges, reading Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, or 2 to 3 in the Tanakh, would receive confiscated properties from those who valued the integrity of their families. The timing was on winter, when it was weighing more heavily upon the people to assemble in short order, and no herald went beyond Judea. The entire assembly is supposed to have acknowledged their obligation to obey Ezra in the matter. Clearly they were those who valued their livelihoods and social ties above family. It was an ugly position to be in. Here Ezra changed the law according to his own edict and it became a Pharisaic law a halakha, enduring to this very day. A woman came to be the determinant factor in deciding whether a child was Jewish or otherwise. Professor Michael Coronaldi cites the Kararite uh, Jewish viewpoint according to Torah thus, and all congregation they assembled in first, that is the first unto the second month, and they declared lineage upon their families to their father's houses, and coming forth a son of an Israelite, Israelite feminine uh, woman, son of a higher Egyptian man amidst the Benai Israel, son of an Israelite feminine woman, and a higher Israelite man, and they strove in camp, and the son of an Israelite woman cursed and denigrated the name, the name of God, and they brought him to Moses. So the Karaites uh, cite uh, these verses from Torah, these verses were from Numbers, chapter 1, verse 18a, from Leviticus 24, verse 10, and again from Leviticus 24, uh, verse 11a. In contrast, the Talmud, uh, ruled by matrilineal descent, the origin of Talmudic matrilineal descent, in contrast to the Tanaic period, Madrash Halakha, is a subject of ongoing research. This information was given to us, Jewishness, determined according to matrilineal descent through Michael Coronaldi, the problem of the patrilineal or matrilineal descent in an intermarriage according to the Samaritan and Rabbinic Halakha. Now he tells us that the literature of the Tanakh uh, period is still a subject of ongoing research. Before the Torah stipulations were intended to be expanded, as is exemplified in the foremost uh, command specifically derived by Ezra, as will be outlined imminently in translation, preparations for the Prince Messiah to be reigning in Jerusalem, such as the closure of the Eastern Gate, were essential, referring to Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 1 to 5, neither King Koresh nor Shetzbatsa 
who is Daniel, see Rashi on uh, Rashi on Daniel chapter one verse eight, the prince in exile, or possibly I think one of his students resided in Jerusalem. So these potential candidates were not any of those anointed literally. Zerubbabel ben Shealtiel uh, never reigned as monarch in Jerusalem. It may be that Kemia was unable to provide any sound case for a fully independent state. I'm reading the Kemia 6 verse 6. And Ezra's expectations were focused on a rebuilt temple in which a se sequence of uh, Davidic messiahs would eventually reign over a restored Israel and the surrounding nations. Indeed, Yehovah God addressed Zerubbabel ben Shealtiel through Haggai the prophet concerning the recently reconstructed temple and its lack of glory. Refer to Haggai chapter 2 verse 3. And there was a promise of great glory through three prophets. The very glory of Yehovah and his Messiah. Read Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 2 to 4. Haggai chapter 2 verse 9 and Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. A promise unto those who were partaking in the revival of Torah in Israel. The words were spoken according to the second temple era and the allotment of time was measured out having been given a firm foundation. Now, Ezra brought Torah readings to the people en masse. Rashi associates next verse with the old calendar of Orthodox Judaism's Rosh Hashanah, or Head of the Year, read Nehemia chapter 8 verse 2. This appears to be the precedent for the fundamental Pharisaic alteration of the Mosaic calendar. Although Rashi and some Christian commentators claim that the words were being indiscriminately translated to the people, the language of the text does not support this assertion. Read Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 7 to 9. The implication is that some tradition and or other interpretation was being expounded to support their theology and usur usurpation of power. The people now understood Torah according to how they were indoctrinated. Read Isaiah 28 verse 9, but it was limited by the absence of passages omitted in the recitation to conceal the law in regard to intermarriage. Read Nehemia chapter 8 verse 12. Certain passages must have been read, for example, Genesis 24 verses 3 to 4, uh, chapter 26 verses 34 to 35, ch uh, chapter 27. 46 to chapter 28 verse 1 and 6 or Numbers chapter 25 verses 1 to 15 and other verses avoided such as Numbers chapter 12 verse 1. Alternatively the latter passage was given a rabbinical spin. Perhaps there is a lesson to be learnt regarding biblical editing comparing the extent of one perspective on intermarriage over another. Uh, refer to Ezra chapter 9 verse 12 or 13 in the Tanakh and 14 or verse 15 in the Tanakh up to the subsequent verses. It is evident that for Ezra to pull off what was essentially a bloodless coup in a tidy manner Refer to Ezra chapter 10 verses 7 to 8 and Nehemia chapter 13 to 25. He had to do something spectacular other than simply presenting the wealth and assuming the authority of a foreign king. Read Ezra chapter 8 verses 13 to 16 and 21 to 22 and chapter 9 verse 9. Presenting a scroll of Torah, reading by right according to his accepted lineage, and restoring the Mosaic festivals was just so. And it was, conveniently, also necessary to restore the nation as part of a religious revival movement. Read Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 32 to chapter 10 verse 39, which is verse 40 in the Tanakh, uh, chapter 12 
and verses 44 to 47. Yet there appears to be some missing terminology in the scroll describing the former events. The seeds of dissent sown by Ezra and his supporters were to be reverberating throughout the history of the Second Temple period. There was never a period of extended stability and various forms of foreign superpowers it was prophesied by Daniel, Daniel chapter 2 verse 31 to 45, dominated or at least continually troubled Israel. The Dead Sea sect were of Sadakim Sadducee origins, being those who had departed Jerusalem under Pharisaic persecution. The Ferushim fought the Sadakim factions even to the point of civil war during the Hasmonean warrior priest's reign, circa 96 BC. King Jonathan Alexander, or Janius, uh, siding for a time with the Seleucid, Seleucid forces. They even fought each other treacherously some decades later in the disputes between the factions of Shammai and Halal. Concerning the festival, what seems to be more likely is to read the text as though the B'nai Israel had not observed Sukkot consistently since the time of Joshua, reading the Kemia, chapter 8, verse 17. It is of interest that those who observe the festival are only those who returned according to the literal text, not necessarily those who remained. And the term all the people is not applied again in this scroll. Compare this to Ezra chapter 9 verses 10 to 15. Read again from the Tanakh. Messiah chapter 6 verse 12b and verse 13 and Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 22 and great is the desolation in the midst of the land and in her moreover one tenth yet turn back and there comes to be a purging as a terebinth stump and as an oak which is felled. In them her stump is a holy seed. Ezekiel. And a widow and she who has been cast aside, they shall not take unto them to wed, rather that it be virgins from a seed of Israel's house. And the widow who has come to be widowed from a priest, they shall take. Now, the repression concerning the foreign women follows an unflinching course, reading the Kemia, chapter 10, verse 30 or 31 of the Tanakh. The command not to give away sons or daughters to the former peoples of the land is applied to seven specific nations within Israel according to Moses, reading Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. Given the promises to David's progeny, despite his relationship with Bathsheba, who was married to a Hittite, the observance of this law must have been deemed as having run its course by this time. Compare this to Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, or verse 4 in the Tanakh, Ezra chapter 9, verse 11, 12 in the Tanakh, or Surah 17, verse 1 and 04, many generations having passed, Uriah being deemed a citizen, and the way of Moses having surpassed the former religions. Yet here it is being forcibly applied centuries later to those who were not necessarily under the renewed form of the statute given in expectation of the Messiah to come, and his Aaronic lineage being applied specifically to those who qualified as priests. Reading Isaiah chapter 6 verse 13 and Ezekiel 44, 22 as we've just read, but not the Levites. Compare this to Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 29 to 30. Apparently Nehemiah blatantly distorts the meaning of the Torah further on, claiming that a male Israelite cannot marry an Ammonites or a Moabites. Uh, reading Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, verse 4 in the Tanakh, or Nehemiah 
chapter 13 verses 1 to 3. We've got some big problems going on here because people to this day, Jews especially, are referring back to the Tanakh and taking the Kemia and Ezra to be the word of God and they're not reading what Moses has to say. And the Quran gives a specific warning on this matter. Now some more specific readings. We're going to Nehemiah 12 verse 30. And the priests and the Levites, they're purifying themselves and purifying the people and the gates and the wall. Read uh, Ezra chapter 2 verse 63 or Mark chapter 7 verse 4. John chapter 18, 28 B to C. Compare this to 1 Maccabees. Chapter 4, verses 34 to 36. Here at last we find the most definitive proof that Ezra, in conjunction with his strongest supporters who were essentially running things, was some kind of Farish, uh, Pharisee, employing Pharisaic traditions not derived from Torah. Perhaps he is even a type of anti-Messiah, a false shepherd. Rashi's purport for the succeeding verse, and I've seen a Kemia 12, verse 31, tells us that the means to cleansing the city and the people was via the two great processions which may have given songs. Uh, taking a JPS 1985 reading, and or sacrifice to God, see Rashi et al, the translation therein, but this is beginning to read as the worship the high places. Indeed, Rashi makes reference to the Talmudic writings which emphasize the essence of Phariseeism, the consumption of food in ritually purified states. So in the Babylonian Talmud said uh, Nezikin, uh, Tractate Shavuoth, uh, 14a and 15. It does appear distinctly possible that when some of the Jews heard of Isaiah being the first, speaking of being amongst a people of unclean lips, referring to Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5 and James chapter 3 verses 9 to 10, then they assumed incorrectly that they were being instructed to eat and drink in a state of ritual purity. Yet even Rashi's best reference does not support what occurred, for it only reads Jerusalem, is sanctified by that which must be eaten within it, and if it goes without, it becomes invalid. Uh, Cross reference to Tractate Shavuot 15a, but this is considered to be in respect to the two loaves of offering within the house, the temple. The rabbis suggest that Nehemiah's two large thanks offerings were two large leavened loaves. Rashi reads, and when they went out of the city in order to encompass it, they went to the right side. Tosaf suggests, probably in a speculative manner as Rashi, that they marched within the perimeter of the wall. But I say the whole thing is farcical. There is nothing from Moses which makes any connection to this line of thought, indeed with respect to cleansing city walls and gates. Surely it must be pointed out that the text is very vague in terms of identifying the source of this scroll. Yet the commentators seem unanimous that this portion is inferring the writer to be Nehemiah, Referring to Nehemiah 13 verses 4 to 9, this is written in the first person, therefore, but much of the previous text was in the third person. Some parts appear to be lists, and the same is true for Ezra. Around 454 or otherwise 433 BC, Nehemiah was called to his master in Babylon, King Artaxerxes I of Persia, he being married to various queens of Babylon. When he is gone there, Elisha, high priest, referring to Nehemiah, chapter 3, verse 1 and 13, verse 28, in charge of at least one sector of the temple, it consents to his relative, Tobiah, taking his rightful place in the sanctum. See Flavius Josephus Antiquities of the Jews, 1731. 
he is apparently a foe to Nicemia. Reading Nicemia chapter 6, verse 1, 14 to 19. Let it be noted that Nicemia was deemed a eunuch. See Rashi's commentary uh, on Nicemia chapter 2, verse 6, and the extended subduedhood. And this is most likely the reason for his self deprecating statement as in Nicemia chapter 6, verse 11. On his return, Nicemia has to buy his chosen gear and food ejected, simultaneously declaring the chamber unclean. This is a clear case of political rivalry overshadowing priestly affairs. For reasons that are not preserved in the extant record, there has been a serious lapse in the previous uh, temple order, reading the Kemia, chapter 13, verses 10 to 13. It would seem that Ezra is now deceased, for these details are not ascribed to him in any way but unto one called Zadok. Nehemiah orders tithes to be given again, and the Levites and singers are recalled from the countryside. New appointments are made. Nehemiah institutes a second wave of religious reform, restoring observance of the day of rest, that is Shabbat, to all Jerusalem. Read in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 15 to 22. Nehemiah took action in the form of capital punishment against his innocent Jewish brethren, According to the 1985 JPS and Rashi's readings, it was lashes. He also tore out clumps of their hair with the help of his thugs. Instead of promoting learning Hebrew for the children who spoke a Palestinian dialect, read the Kemia, chapter 13, verses 23 to 27. The grandson of Elisha was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Moabite. Reading Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, it appears that Sanballat had tried many years ago to trick him into violating the sanctity of the house and potentially ending up dead through divine retribution. If Ezra did not mess with Ezekiel's scroll, then there was an extension of Torah preventing the line of Aaronite priests from marrying non Israelites. This being legitimized by the regulation of the available scripture, Nehemia had him ejected from the city. He became an outcast, never to return. In uh, Nehemia chapter 13, verse 28. Now, well, let's look at what the Quran has to say about the matter from Surah 9 and verses 30 up to 32. And the Jews said, Ezra, son of God, and the Nazarene said, Messiah is God's son. Uh, their saying, that was with their mouths. They imitate a saying of those who disbelieved from aforetime, God defy them, how beguiled they are. They have taken their sages and their monks as exalted ones from other than God, also the Messiah, son of Miriam, and they were not commanded to do other than that they worship one God. Other than him is not God, glory to be to him from what they associate. They seek to extinguish God's light with their mouths, but God refuses except to perfect his light, even if the disbelievers contend. Refer cross-reference Surah 61 verse 8. Now, earlier I touched on how Israel was elevated in status in the various writings. The term Son of God is found in quite a number of places within the Tanakh and according to different contexts. Now let us briefly examine the last case first. For one particular instance it is written, You are sons to Jehovah, your God, it's from Deuteronomy uh, 14 verse 1. Elsewhere one may be deemed sons of prophets, a son of death and many other things, some of which are anthropomorphic. Yet the focus must be on the Davidic theme as a prophecy of a royal leader over Israel, referring to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. Then although the subsequent Nazarene saying, the word Christian never actually is used once in the Quran, instead there is an Arabic form of the Gospel, Hebrew, carried through in the Greek texts, uh, being worded identically, it has to be read in the 
Quranic context as if Messiah is God the Son. As though by physical relations in the form of triune God, anything other than that would exclude Yeshua as Messiah or even any other form of Davidic Messiah as non-Muslim apostates. Allah, because Allah defines Abraham, Solomon, Sheba and Yeshua's twelve as Muslims in the Quran. This Son of God metaphor may be compared with the transition under Yeshua to sons of his not being directly from his seed. Examine Psalm 89 verses 29 to 30 and verse 36. The point is that the majority of those claiming to believe actually adopted idols in the form of men and thought they were worshipping God by obediently following their blind leaders. Reading what we've just cited, uh, the ninth Surah verses 31 to 32, they all followed a rallying cry without understanding its hidden meaning. In conclusion, let us say it was Ezra and his allies who conspired to become a leading clique, a secret society governing religious affairs through Ezra's reforms, persuading the influential but somewhat unwitting Nehemiah as to the validity of the cause and rewarding their own through property seizures, whilst removing many potential enemies who were previously powerful, dividing families, creating factions in the fabric of their society. The case remains open in terms of what God was actually asking them to do. Either Ezra went way too far in altering what would become the Hebrew Bible, creating differences in existing statutes, else there was actually a decree through Ezekiel to keep the ironic bloodline of Israel so that a Messiah with defined pedigree could emerge. The Kemir achieved many things as a governor, but he learned after a time that the society he had shaped depended on an active chain of independent political command, despite having a high priest. Ezra certainly sowed the seeds of Phariseeism, or Orthodox Judaism, in a fragile society during a period of reform amidst a delicate situation where the survival of the remnant of Israel was but a mysterious promise. Moreover, he most certainly distorted the interpretation of Torah, whether intentionally or not, and he helped preserve it even to this day. So this is a lot to get your head around. You have to read the books of Ezra and Achemia with great diligence. Uh, the message that they are trying to push, you have to see through it. It's not as simple as what it seems. And what they were actually pushing was contrary to Torah in certain aspects. One has to recognize this and recognize that um, things were definitely what not what they seem. In the name of Yahweh God. Amen. Shalom Alec.